what is about Japanese games that inspired it's us? Recent. Oh, uh, recent. 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 I'm sorry. I suck. I'm, I'm sorry, like, you guys need to get with the time. Phil Fish has messed up exponentially in his handling of collective internet conversation, but I feel for him. Even if a lot of what happened was ultimately due to his potent behavior, it's a hard situation to be in. Someone you know could be perfectly collected most of their life, but if they were to fall into internet fame and suddenly have thousands of people collectively breathing down their neck, twisting their words and splicing together footage of them out of context, who's to say they wouldn't change? Who's to say they wouldn't buckle under the pressure and get entangled in a lot of awful arguments on social media? There's no doubt in anyone's mind that Fish is not an innocent man in all of this, but it's a good question to ask ourselves every now and again, since it's very easy to point and criticize. What does internet fame do to a person? For the few of you who don't know, Phil Fish was an indie game developer back in 2012. He was predominantly featured in the documentary Indie Game the Movie before subsequently taking stabs at Japanese game developers and the internet at large. Fast forward some years in many online flame wars, and Phil Fish is not only completely devoid of an internet presence, but he announced and cancelled a sequel to his own game in a matter of days, shaking his fist at the gaming community at large and their toxicity city for why he did so. It doesn't take a behavioral expert to see that Fish brought a lot of what happened to him on himself, but the problem with the internet is it almost never deals out a level of punishment that's appropriate. It really only knows how to escalate, and because of that, it must have been a real blow to his mental health, whether he deserved it or not. Regardless of the scorched earth Phil left in his wake, amid the rubble and sizzling piles of debris, he left behind a single amazing gift, and that gift is Fez. A manifestation of his love for the original Zelda and the cryptic nature of earlier video games, Fez is a squared-off, pixelated odyssey that gently invites you into its world and doesn't stop unraveling until the final, cryptic ending. Even ten years later, it's pretty amazing how well this thing holds up. This game could have stayed silly, and there is definitely some of that, but it sets up a strong, quiet atmosphere so effortlessly that before you know it, it doesn't feel like you're playing a funny little video game. Navigating the beautiful floating islands of Fez's world World as you collect cubes, artifacts, and maps is a transient experience I've felt in seldom platformers out there. Add to that the day and night cycle, plus the environmental diversity, and you have a real recipe for an immersive world. There are a ton of indies today that have really challenged the standard of platformers not having very in-depth stories, but Fez is no such game. Besides some lighthearted banter in the starting village that riffs on old adventure stories and the occasional quips from your cube companion, there's practically nothing story-wise. Your relationship with this environment stays as video gamey as one could think, with the entire goal being merely to collect different things, including cube pieces, artifacts, and maps which give you insight into areas that you couldn't have possibly known about without looking at them. The focus stays purely on the exploration and your ability to turn the world in one of four directions. Not unlike Super Paper Mario's screen-turning mechanic, Fez lets you twist the entire screen on a dime whenever you'd like with the disadvantages of perspective being completely circumvented. Areas that were previously impossible to jump or climb to crumble under your simple ability, and taking advantage of it is super enjoyable. Even when getting to the top of an area isn't necessarily hard, it's still fun to transverse because seeing the path forward unravel in front of you as you switch perspectives shows how cleverly set up the design of the area was in the first place. The jumping and moveset taken on their own is not the most sophisticated kit in the world and is merely a supplement to the world turning mechanic. That being said, it does feel pretty good. Fez lands with the weight and enthusiasm you'd expect of him, and dodging black holes as you climb and leap towards your next cube piece is a fun time. Taking a tour through Fez, you start to get an appreciation for how carefully it reveals its cards to you. Just as things start to feel stale, you'll happen across a new level object such as a bomb or crate that give you new means to interact with not just the environment, but your world shifting mechanic too. There are even areas where you aren't able to turn the camera at all. Level design 101 stuff, sure, but it's clear that Fish knows what he's doing here and uses it to great effect throughout the duration of the game. It would be untruthful to say that Fez doesn't have its flaws, for as elegantly as it nails its goals, you will have the occasional moment where you are at a loss for cube pieces and will not know how to proceed. For the most part, you will always have some corner of the world you can tug at to make progress, but that doesn't stop this occasional blemish from showing up. There's also the fact that even though Fez is a single player game, it was made from the ground 
ground up to not be a game a single person could 100%. Taking steps to one-up the first Legend of Zelda, some secrets in the game could not be unearthed unless the internet was collectively working together. It goes beyond just cryptic button inputs. There are parts where you have to know binary code to proceed in getting a collectible. Whether Fish did this because it was impossible at the time of his original inspiration or not is unclear, but in an alternate universe where video games are not nearly as handholdy and Phil sets the standard for what the industry should do, this is a scary precedent indeed. There are so many rooms and little places that aren't immediately obvious in what you're supposed to do, arguably to a fault, but that does make the eventual unraveling of what the secret is all the more sweeter. Putting the Twitter stuff aside, Fez is not just an indie. It's years of blood, sweat, and emotion poured into one game, carefully crafted and combed over until even a perfectionist like Phil Fish can enjoy it. It's a snapshot of what Polytron could have been, a time capsule of what its sequel and its creator had the potential to keep creating, and it's really unfortunate that things turned out the way they did. That hasn't stopped fans from chiming in to occasionally post some neat content. On top of this demake on itch.io, there's also Fez-Tool, a collection of four levels that combine Fez's gameplay with the mechanics from Valve's Portal series. It's not Fez 2, nor will it ever be, but it is a fun little appetizer if you just can't get enough of the main title. Wherever Phil Fish is now, I hope that he's able to find an inner peace and tranquility that's half as beautiful as Fez. Fez.